we've seen in decades. Um, there are a number of outstanding proposals, and actually uh, also inquiries. The Children's Media Inquiry is not a proposal, it's gathering information. But broadcast localism is one uh, that um, proposes um, really detailed and I think onerous uh, obligations for broadcasters in terms of what the FCC euphemistically calls guidelines uh, for amounts of programming in particular categories, uh, broadcast ownership, low power radio service, enhanced disclosure, which is something that the FCC under Chairman Martin adopted and is currently, uh, well, it's currently on hold, but it's also uh, embroiled in several court challenges. And then, uh, of course, network neutrality. So there are a number of areas in which regulations are at least being discussed, maybe pending, uh, proceedings are ongoing, in which the future of media may be defined and, along with it, regulatory classifications and potential First Amendment standards. At the same time, the FC FTC, stepping a little bit outside its usual role, uh, is looking at the future of journalism and will it survive in the digital age. And uh, Chairman Leibowitz promises future sessions to examine various policy proposals, including potential subsidies, tax breaks, antitrust treatment of news gathering organizations, changes in copyright law, and a laundry list of other things. Now, it seems kind of benign when you're talking about just helping out uh, journalism. Who could be against that? I'm a former reporter. Uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for other people who are journalists, and I, I want to see them supported a lot. But at the same time, when two federal agencies start talking about how they're going to help out journalism and ensure its future, I begin to reach my wallet find out who's trying to sell me what here. And when you look at the history of government entanglement in, in communications institutions, even for benign purposes, I think it does create some cause for concern. One of the uh, usual examples that is given of the government helping out uh, um, the press is the history of postal subsidies. And it's true, uh, the establishment of the post office, post roads, and so on, did help colonial newspapers. But at the same time, we also have a history of the post office using its postal subsidies to manipulate favoring you know, that content that it prefers, trying to disfavor content that it dislikes, and so on. We also know from other First Amendment cases that when you have government involvement in terms of financial support, you also have, in many cases, an erosion of full First Amendment protection. For example, if you look at public broadcasting, which is a terrific addition to the number of choices that people have. It's also true that public broadcasting does not have the same level of editorial discretion as commercial broadcasting because of the length of public funding. Uh, you also have cases like Finley versus the NEA, or I'm sorry, NEA versus Finley, where the Supreme Court said that if you're getting a National Endowment for, uh, for the Arts grant, then the government can impose a condition saying that the grant for has to keep in mind standards of decency. It's useful to know that in some of these uh, uh, proceedings, that uh, the types of proposals that are being advocated are having an NEA-type NEA organization for journalists. Uh, and so with those kinds of help, with those kinds of solutions, also come ties. For example, the E-rate, uh, by which the federal government, starting with the uh, 96 Act, funds schools and libraries. With the 96 Act, they tied that funding to um, uh, filtering funds in libraries where the federal government provides funds for libraries, those libraries have to provide internet content filters. And yet, for libraries that don't accept that money, uh, they don't have to have filters, or if they try to impose them as a matter of government regulation, that's a violation of the First Amendment. So I'm not trying to say that the two proceedings of the FTC and the FCC are nefarious. Again, I think journalism, journalism uh, should get all the help that it can. But I think it's also important to recognize that in those kinds of proceedings also comes risk, and not to be too cynical about it, but I have been practicing law in Washington for over 25 years, uh, I think there may be an interest by some to find a way to impose strings and conditions and regulations that otherwise, if they tried to impose directly, uh, they would find themselves blocked in the courts. And that's why there's a Trojan horse. We see the same thing coming up in the uh, debate over network neutrality. Again, it's being um, fashioned as a, um, a debate to preserve the free and open internet. <coughs> and um, you know, I don't uh, question that motive on behalf of anybody. What it does, though, is suggest that the government ought to have jurisdiction to be able to manage 
uh, the uh, network management practices of network providers. And uh, one of the things that was the hallmark of the internet was that it developed without government met control over its management. Um, we have uh, the network neutrality rulemaking going on now. And we also have, as a result of current litigation over the FCC's jurisdictional reach in this area, certain people advocating that the FCC should simply, by regulatory classification, change how the internet and their broadband providers are classified under the Communications Act. We should go back and not treat them as information service providers, which was the subject of another decade-long legal battle, but instead should reclassify them as common carriers under Title II of the Communications Act, which of course then would also have implications for the constitutional analysis once you reclassify them as, uh, as a, a common carrier. So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of important stuff just lurking in all of these proceedings that are going to have profound implications for whether or not convergence is an improvement um, under, uh, in, in First Amendment or whether or not it's a, a regression. And then, of course, what about the children? In every debate over tele uh, communications policy, particularly when we're talking about content, the bottom line question becomes, what regulations do we need to make sure the children are protected? Even though, of course, uh, two-thirds of American households don't have children in them, but that's never really stopped the proponents of those, uh, those rules. Uh, and, and what we see now uh, with proceedings that are going on both this study mandated by Congress and proceedings at the FCC is that the bodies are branching out and not focusing just on broadcasting uh, or cable or areas where they have uh, more of a jurisdictional background, but instead looking more, more broadly to all media. So uh, the Child Safe Viewing Act um, required the FCC to report to Congress on uh, the various platforms, including TV, DVD players, games, set-top boxes, satellite receivers, wireless devices, and so on, and to determine whether or not these various technologies uh, are really allowing parents to control what, what their kids get access to. Last year, um, Congress uh, received the report, last August 29th, and the findings that the FCC reached in the CSVA report were really remarkable. Essentially, they confirmed that scarcity is a thing of the past, that there are multiple electronic technologies providing lots of content uh, over uh, multiple platforms. The number of suppliers of online video is almost limitless, and that people can receive video over mobile phones. Uh, television programming that pr previously was available only through the um, living room television set is now available over phones and online and, and everywhere else, and that there are a wide variety of viewer control tools and strategies that are provided both by regulation and by uh, market forces that allow people to control what comes into their homes. In other words, the CSVA report confirmed that the historic justifications in Red Lion and in Pacifica are really things of the past. Although I have to say, there is one caveat in, in the report that says, but we still think indecency regulation is necessary. But of course, they were in court, so they, I think they needed that footnote. That then led to, since this is Washington, another study. And the FCC released an inquiry on children and the media. This is empowering parents and protecting children in an evolving media landscape. And like the CSVA report before it, it looks broadly at all media and not just uh, the um, uh, traditional media that are subject to regulation, and asks the question, how can or should current laws be updated to reflect this convergence and to keep pace with changes in technology? Now keep in mind, um, all of the previous regulations were justified because of some aspect of scarcity. Either there were scarcity of frequencies, which justified programming mandates so that broadcast stations would meet the public interest, or there was a scarcity of available technology to, uh, to allow people to control what kind of information that came into their car or their home or wherever they happened to be. The problem that is identified in the CSPA report and to a certain extent asked about in the FCC's inquiry on empowering parents is that we have too much stuff. There's too much programming to deal with. There are too many parental controls. How can we keep track of it and make sure that it serves the public interest? It completely reverses the justifications that have previously been used to justify a regulatory approach. And we have also have seen certain proposals already floated uh, not yet adopted that would um, sort of grasp the nettle 
and um, require these kinds of things. This is for the uh, further notice for advanced wireless services that would impose a direct filtering requirement for those who would provide uh, free broadband service as part of uh, a network requirement. How far can it go? Uh, it seems unthinkable, doesn't it, that your electronic book uh, could be subject to FCC regulation. And I'm not saying that anybody has actually proposed this. But for the kinds of things that are being discussed, for the regulatory justifications that we hear about extending regulation beyond traditional media to uh, new media, there's really no reason why you wouldn't be able to extend regulation in this way. Or as Ron Collins, who formerly was the First Amendment scholar at the Freedom Forum, said, if history is, a gu is any guide, it's only a matter of time before someone comes up with a, a public airwaves justification for re-regulating e-books as we do some other media. And why not? I mean, you do get books delivered by uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And of course, what about the children? Now, who knows what they're going to be reading? Now, I didn't select Harry Potter just by accident here. It is the most censored book in America, according to the American Library Association, because certain groups think that it takes witchcraft a little bit too seriously. But uh, you know, not to be facetious, I'm sure there are other things that people don't want their children reading. And all you have to do is look at the American Library Association's list that they come up with every year about petitions to take books out of school libraries. And of course, uh, fairness may also always be an issue. Um, Amazon claims that it makes 450,000 books available, has 101 of 112 New York Times current bestsellers. What about the other 11? What if they wanted to be on the Kindle and Kindle didn't do the deal? Can they be forced to, as a matter of regulatory fiat, uh, just to be fair? Should politicians be empowered to have their campaign biographies available on the Kindle? There's a hot read for you. Um, or should there be equal opportunities rules? It's uh, hard to say. And, and actually, uh, you know, to go back to the net neutrality debate for, for just a minute, one of the objections to those who've suggested that Title II should be extended to broadband devices uh, have said that one implication of that would, would be that it would extend regulation to a device like the Kindle and make it a Title II um, uh, uh, common carrier. So what's going to happen? It's hard to say. Um, again, it's way too early in this administration to know what they're actually going to propose. At this point, what we have are the broadband report, which is really just very broad outlines. We have inquiries, like the children's media inquiry. We have the um, network neutrality those for rulemaking. And they suggest ways, if someone were very regulatory minded, they could go. But we haven't seen them go in that direction yet. Um, what we do know is that there are people who are advocating stronger regulations that would test the boundaries of whether or not convergence is going to lead to more regulation or less. Uh, and for myself, I tend to side with Ithiel de Sola Pool to be kind of an optimist, saying that uh, as long as we have courts that recognize strong First Amendment protections, and as long as technology is dynamic, then I think we will uh, see those protections expand. And I do think that um, there's cause to be optimistic that if it comes down to protecting new technologies or not, that uh, the Supreme Court is likely to take them seriously. So thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Mr. Upross. Bob, I think there's, there's a piece, I think, missing here. And I'm really concerned that we're, the government is attracting our attention in one place while potentially doing something. Uh, you had this entire discussion about the different screens and the internet and the television screen and the DBS and so on. What you didn't have up there was the rulemaking or it's going to be a notice of inquiry that's going to come out this month where the commission is proposing that all screens have a standardized input so that it doesn't matter whether it came from the internet or the television set or the satellite or whatever. And what they're doing, or what the proposal is, is to standardize the receiving device for everything. And then the logic 
as, as you've already pointed out, they've already turned the logic up.